Hi, my name is John Messina, and welcome to another edition of Hey Coach. Here we have a very special guest. I had to do a lot of persuading to get her on the show. Uh, a good friend of mine, Gina Luther, who used to be the assistant principal at Centennial, a graduation coach at Fort Bear Central, and she's very content in retirement right now. Very content. Very content, okay? And she was the first female football coach in St. Lucie County. Yes, I was. Can we explain that? Um, let's see, that was back in 1994, 95. I was working at Westwood. Um, our head coach was Wendell Early at the time. And um, Mr. Jim was our principal back then. And um, I started working, it was just a fluke. I was, he asked me if I would help um, tutor kids that needed help and I said, sure. Then the following year, he offered me a position as like an academic coach. And I said, okay, that works. Um, the funny part was the other male coaches kind of didn't like the idea that I didn't have to work on Saturday when they had to break down film. You made a special contract. Yes, I did. Okay. I was, yeah, full page. Special coach. contract. Special contract. Then I got involved in all the equipment. So I became equipment manager and I started handling all the equipment, all the orders, things like that. At the, in the interim, I was also working with NCAA. Um, recruiters would contact me before they contacted the coaches and the kids. So I could give input there. And then eventually, the guys, other coaches, made me get on the football field. And I started working doing agilities with the guys and then kicking. So he started, I was the You were the kicking coach. coach. Yeah. You were I special teams apples. coach. Yeah. yeah. I was going to ask you your time in the 40, but, you know. No, we'll forget go, we'll it. Go. I have no time in the 40. Okay. But that was a wonderful right. experience. And, and it really promoted right. the idea of academic. We had lost, he had lost 13 players to academic um, ineligibility because of their grades and stuff like that. So it made a huge difference when I started with them we didn't lose any more kids well that's basically what we're going to be talking about with this show today um last few shows we're talking you know mainly athletic issues safety issues um different fhsaa issues but today i want to talk a lot about uh, academics but before we start i i got to put this in a good friend of ours jay stewart has come back very short retirement very short very short and he uh you know, I, I, Jay taught me so much when he was the county athletic director, and he helped guide us through some tough times, especially financial times in this county. And um, he retired after many years as the AD at Fort Pierce Central as the county athletic director, and now he's at Treasure Coast High School. So we're going to wish Jay good luck. I know you have a lot of good feelings for Jay. I think the world of Jay. Jay taught yeah. me a lot of, a lot of yeah. things about high school athletics and about high school in general, and, you know, a lot of people gave Jay a hard time because, like you said, there was issues with finances and issues with things like that. Yeah. Jay cleaned everything yeah. up, and Jay always told me yeah. that yeah. our job yeah. was to have the back of the principal. Right. Yeah. And I just think the world of Jay, and I hope him yeah. the very best at Treasure Coast. I personally think it's crazy. I, I wouldn't do it. But Jay is Jay, and that's just, he's just awesome. So. I know, I know. I think he was bored to death. And he's coaching soccer at Lincoln Park at the same time. Right. You know, and you know so. he, he was teaching at Dan McCarty right. reading. Right. And he was enjoying that. Right. But I can tell he's coaching again because he lives in my neighborhood, and every once in a while you'll see all his athletes coming I'm out coming and, and working in the neighborhood right. to raise money. So. Right. Well, what we're going to talk about today, and I think this is very, very important for the parents, is the different academic issues that the students and when they should start taking their tests, what the requirements were. Now, first, I'm going to give the requirements that the Florida High School Association gives. In order to be eligible to play, you have to have a cumulative 2.0 each semester. Years ago, and, and this is kind of shocking, it used to be a 1.5. Unbelievable. And, and years ago, we had to um, check the grades every nine weeks, which was really hard. But it was so much easier back then, and I, I'll tell you a funny story on it. There was something called a pink sheet where we had to type in name, address, 
did you pass five classes out of seven, which is everybody does. Did you have a physical? Yes or no? That was it. And then you had to put the birthday. So when I was down in Miami Pace, we were getting ready to go to the state championship, and I was the athletic director and baseball coach. And I get a phone call from Fred Roselle, who's the commissioner at that time. He says, John, congratulations coming to the tournament, fourth straight year. I says, thank you, Mr. Roselle. He says, well, we got a problem. I said, what's the matter? He says, well, four of your kids are ineligible. I'm looking at your pink sheet, okay? That's what happened. He says, I'm the athletic director, too. I says, these kids are great kids. Nobody's ineligible. He says, I'm looking at the sheet now. Now, we had to type in the numbers, right? He said, well, one kid's 104, next one's 92, and two haven't been born yet. Of course, I typed the wrong things. In. But that was funny. Now, nowadays, you would have got a big fine. That, it was a laughter. He says, rip it up and bring a new one up there. But um, in order to be eligible, you have to have this 2-0 and, and the grades are cumulative, okay? Now, this is going to be a lot different than the NCAA requirements, yes. okay? Um, parents think that, geez, let me go get a scholarship. It doesn't work like that. No. And Gina, can you go over some about when they should start taking the test and then I'll throw in the core classes? Okay. If a student athlete is intending to play um, sports and hopefully get a scholarship in college. They really need to start taking the either the SAT or ACT. I recommend after they've completed Algebra 2 or I would recommend the spring of their junior year. Right. In other words, so I think that one of the most important issues with test taking is kids don't really understand what goes on on those tests. High schools do test prep. We do, you know, um, reading classes and, and we give them an idea. But until you sit and take the test, until a student sits and takes the test, they have no idea what that environment's like. So I always recommended kids to take their first test um, the spring of their junior year so they get a a feeling for it. I kind of equated it to when you play in a conference championship. Anybody can play a basketball game or a baseball game, but all of a sudden here comes conference championship and you might be the best, but if you don't have the experience, you don't do well. So that's when they should start. And then they can take the ACT up to 12 times and they can take the SAT, I think, up to six times. So they can always increase and improve their scores. Now, there's something called the NCAA Clearinghouse. Yes. Which is extremely important. Okay, you want to go over that? Mm -hmm. All right, NCAA requires students to apply literally, I, and I'm going to use that word, but it's, it's an application process where NCAA, they govern the scholarships. So there are certain criteria for the, the scholarships and in coursework and, and test scores. So what we have students do is we have them apply or fill out their application to the NCAA. And as I usually started, um, I used to start it at the end of their junior year. Right. Let's get everything organized. Let's get everything together in NCAA. Students are then, are, student athletes are expected to um, put send their test scores to the NCAA and that's a free right that, that's, that's a, all that's free. free but before you do that you have to complete a certain number of core classes you, yes you have to complete or you have to be enrolled or enrolled that's that you have or to you, intending to complete because if, yeah. if a student starts to apply in their at the end of their junior year well right. we're going to know that they're going to be taking English right. for and government and economics once and the thing is, is that you can update that all the right. time. So once a class is completed or once test scores, new test scores come in, it, it goes, it filters right into NCAA. And that comes from the high schools, too. Right. And, and, and also, your core classes, and they're, they're going to give you what they are, okay? And, and it's not advanced basket weaving, which I got straight A's in, by the way. I'm but sure. I know. I'm two-time <laughs> repeater. But... Um, it's your core classes. You have to complete 10 of them. You have to yes. finish 13 yes. and then three electives in order to finish everything with the clearinghouse. But before you, you have to complete 10 before you're cleared in the clearinghouse. Right. Now, you cannot take any visits. And I want to have a little bit of a talk about 
you know, college visits. You can't take any visits until you're registered in the clearinghouse. So it is a process. Parents should start be thinking about this, I would say, sophomore year. If, exactly. Right. If they're looking okay. to have their children go through college right. with scholarship, they better start thinking about it real quickly because right. Right? it's 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 not an overnight right. thing and it's not somebody walks up to you and said here here's your scholarship right. and you get to go to the university of florida or valdosta state or wherever right. it's you have to take these steps and parents need to be aware of that right. that's the academic part now also you're allowed once you're cleared five visits now, these are official visits where the school will actually pay for it. Right. The coaches will meet you. They have sort of a standardized tour. But what parents don't understand, if you're close to a college, if you're here and you want to go to Gainesville, you can go up on your own anytime, which I would highly recommend. You can actually meet with the coaches as long as it's not official. You can actually meet with the guidance counselors. You can take a tour. And, and you could see that. But I, I think the biggest thing, and, you know, I did this many, many years, got to be realistic. What do you want? Where do you want to go? I want a scholarship. Do you want to go out of state? No. Okay, well, now, now we're limited. Right. Okay? You've you got to be realistic. Now, um, today I went online. I was proud of myself. I got online and everything today. But I looked up the number of scholarships, and this is striking for different sports. Okay. Division one, all right, your big schools, you know, Miami, your Florida, your Florida State. Okay, I'm not going to go through them all, but few of them. Football is 85, okay? It's a lot. They press out 100. So right. there's kids, you know, you always see this kicker, he just kicked the game winning field goal. Well, now you're on scholarship because they're dressing out 100. Basketball, 11, or excuse me, baseball, 11.7. Now, baseball, they'll carry 25 to 30 players. There's only 11 scholarships. Per college? Per college. Okay. Your stars are going to get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So now your other 20 players are going to split those four scholarships that are left. And we're going to talk about that in a minute, how they split them. Some of the other sports, basketball, 13. Golf, four and a half. I don't know how they get these halves here. Soccer, 9.9. .9, okay. Women's soccer, 14, a little bit bigger. And I, I just don't, I'm not sure of how they divided this up. Now, if you went to, in football, what they call the FCS, which is like um, North Dakota State, Monmouth, okay. uh, Youngstown, their football scholarships are down to 63, okay? Division two, 36, this is for football. Division three, you're on your own. You're on your own. And AIA, you're on your own. You're on your own. So, there's financial ways, and, I, and we're going to talk right. about the different financial ways there. Um, so it's like a progression going down from Division One all the way down. Now, another important thing about these scholarships, the one-year renewable in most cases. I, I was reading an article um, online the other day where the University of Nebraska hired a new coach. He used to coach in the, um, in the NBA. And all of a sudden, he's got 13 new players. Now, he didn't have 13 seniors last year. So the kid's coming back, see ya, okay? Now, that's kind of cruel, but that's a reality, okay? Unless you're the superstar, you better be going to these schools for your academics and for your career also. Okay, so let's, let's take, for example, I'm just throwing baseball out. They got 11 and a half scholarship. They got 25 players. My stars are going to take seven of them. I got four scholarships left. What can these young men do to get the money for them? One of the biggest things that kids can do is have bright futures. Okay, can we explain the bright All right, futures? bright future scholarships are awarded through the state of Florida through the lottery program. Uh, there's three levels of them. The one is an academic, one is the medallion, and I don't know if they're still doing gold seal or not. But these are scholarships that students earn based on grade point averages and test scores. So let's say, John, you are going to go to, uh, say, University of Miami. Oh, All right? Give me another school. All oh, right. Okay. Say <laughs> you're going to go to University of South Florida. Okay. There are only 11 and a half scholarships. Right. All right. I'm the coach. 
when I come and I meet with you and okay. I see that you have your bright futures, you're going to be eligible for bright futures. I can take that and have a little bit more scholarship left. In other words, so when I see you, John, let's say you're eligible for bright futures and let's say you have a Pell Grant. What's a Pell Grant? Pell Grant is money from the federal government for kids who um, live either at or below poverty. Free and reduced lunch kids. Okay. They're automatic Pell Grant kids. So here's what you're bringing to the table. I want to offer you a scholarship, but I don't have, I only have 11 and a half scholarships. But when you bring to the table, here, coach, I have a Pell Grant. Here, coach, I've earned bright futures. Now, all of a sudden, that $15,000 I had for that one scholarship, there's where your half comes right. in. I can take all that Pell Grant money and all that bright futures money and then I only have to use part of the scholarship. So it's now I have extra. part. But it's now I have extra right, money for right, other people. Right. So that's how that right, works. Right. When, when I was coaching um, two years, I was over at Jensen Beach. You know, we're a pretty average team. Every one of our seniors got scholarships. They were going to Lafayette. They were going to Belmont. They went to Dartmouth. And this is academics. And, and this is what, again, the parents have to understand this. It's not that easy getting scholarships. It's no, not. it's, it's not. getting harder and harder. Now, the academic requirements have something called the sliding scale. Okay? Now, with the sliding scale, in order, each school is different. If I'm not mistaken, I know Fred Alamade, our good buddy over mm -hmm. at Centennial, always tells me that the private schools are a little bit of a disadvantage from the state schools. Okay? So, if, for example, if your grade point average was a 3.0, you might need, I'm just throwing these numbers out, you might need 1,100 on your SATs, okay? It's kind of okay. low. Now, if your grade point average was a 2.8, you might need 1,250 on your SATs. If your grade point average was a 3.5, you might need 900 on your SATs. Each school and each, I think they go by conferences, you know. But again, these are some things that the parents have to check, okay? Right. And you've got to watch what classes you, you, you're taking. You you've have to. You've got to take those core classes. Especially your math classes. Okay, explain the math classes. Well, math, math classes are required um, Algebra 1 and Geometry. Okay. And the next class, um, NCAA requires it's an algebra based course. So, we offer math for college readiness. That might not qualify or, or inter, integrated math. Right. These types of classes might not qualify under NCAA. We can graduate kids from them. Um, we can, with them, we can, they can go to state colleges. Some state colleges will take them. But to be NCAA scholarship recipients, they have to have the right coursework all the way down the line. So that's the other thing we have to worry, we have to concern ourselves with. It's, it's not just getting the GPA right. It is a matter of making sure the academic, your, your academic history is valid. And, and you have to have a plan as a parent, okay? If, if, if you're, you know, kind of guiding your son or daughter to get a scholarship, okay? And, and you know, and I, I think one of the kind of, bad points in the last maybe 15 years is that parents are making the kids play one sport rather than many, many different sports. I was on the state, um, all state academic committee for many years and in order to qualify for their finals, you had to have 3.5, you had to do community service, involved in clubs, but you had to play two or more sports for three consecutive years. When we first started, we had 600 applications. My last year, we got about 120. And it wasn't because of the grades, it wasn't because of the community service, it was because parents were directing their kids for one sport. And, and you know, and again, you know, we had a whole show on injuries. Well, parents and, yeah. feel that it's not just high school sports anymore. Now when you're in high school and you're, you're playing football, let's, let's play volleyball, because right. my daughter played right. volleyball. So let's play volleyball. She played softball and she ran track her freshman year. Right. Um, and then it was all volleyball. And now all of a sudden, mom, it's travel ball. I got to do travel ball. So a lot of it's people. It's nonstop. It's nonstop. nonstop. So yeah. a lot of people believe 
that it's necessary mm -hmm. to play that sport year round. Now we have seven on seven for football. You have football during the, the school year and you have seven on seven, you have these community yeah. or, or city leagues. Mm -hmm. That has taken a, lo a lot right. away. It's yeah. taken so much away because first of it, the most important thing is community. You know, when I graduated from high school 100,000 years ago, you had four, you had kids that had lettered in four sports, and they were the superstars. You don't have that anymore. We don't have that no. anymore, and, no. and as far as I'm concerned, we're so concerned about making sure our kids doing what they're supposed to do in one specific sport, they tend to forget that there needs to be some kind of variety, and coaches are looking for that. And I think that the biggest thing, and we work together, so you know when I'm, I'm coming from with this, I really got mad at a lot of my coaches when they say, well, my athletes got to play football. I'm just using football as a year round. It's not your athlete, okay? No. Um, we had a young lady at Centennial way back when, which I'm not going to mention her name, but she was the best. And she played basketball, got a scholarship to Old Dominion, and she wanted to play softball and track at the same time. And it's the exact same season. And our coaches were feuding. And the poor young lady was very upset. And I brought everybody in and said, look, you got 10 minutes to make a decision or I'm going to tell you. And she ended up going to the Final Four for softball. And she won the state track championship. But you don't have people like that anymore. No, you, you just don't. don't. And, and your correct coaches do fight over yeah. their, you know, their, their best players or whatever. Usually what we see now is kids that are playing football can run track. Well, of course they can because they need to keep or, their or, skills. Or, or on the wrestling team. But I've also yeah. seen where we've yeah. had incredible football players play basketball, yeah. and we need those kids on the basketball floor, but they can't be because they're playing football and they don't share. Well, one of the problems is, and I'll blame this on the state, years ago, and I guess we remember this, you had a break in between seasons. Right, and they you don't. You had your Everything fall overlaps. season, and then you had a break. You had your winter season, and then you had a break. So you know what? These students could become kids again. You know, now everything overlapped. Football just got over Friday. Last Friday they had the state championships. That started in August. If you went all the way to the state championship, you played 15 games plus preseason. That's 16. That's NFL. You know, I kind of think these seasons are too long. Everything overlaps. I went out to the baseball state championship last year out in Fort Myers. 50 people in the stands. Why? Because they stretched out to June 6th. People have been out of school for three weeks. Right. There's, you got to wait. You're putting the kids in a bad position. I agree with you. You, you really do. And that, that's something we have talked about. Another thing that um, I think you could notice is let's look at our college athletes, okay? In football, you got to play three years, and then you're eligible for a draft. Baseball, softball, you got to play three years, too. Basketball, you got to play one. You're one and done. Okay? Now, I know some of these schools, everybody's doing it. You know, I thought Duke would be the last holdout about not doing it. Do you really think these players are going to classes after the first semester? Because once the grades come in in December and they're cleared, they're cleared for the rest of the year. I, you mean college level? College level. You're cleared. I do, I do believe that. I do think that, well, it depends. Yeah, it depends. Let me, let me, let's go back. It depends on the coaches. Right. It depends right. on the coaches right. because I know that when my daughter wound up going to a small right. private college in West right. Virginia and her season was over because hers was a fall season, yeah. coaches were still all over them making sure they were in classes yeah. and making, so I think it's a matter of, of coaches yeah. and whether or not the coaches are actually invested in the kids or are they invested in the game? They're invested in, well, I have a job, so I better win. I better win. And, and I think that's another yeah. thing our kids have a hard time with because yeah. our football coaches, and I'm sure that in all of our high schools in St. Lucie County yeah. and, and all the public yeah. high schools around, they are invested. I know the yeah. coach from, from Central is a very invested man, yeah. and he watches his kids. Yeah. He makes sure they're okay. He's come to me many times asking me to help a kid get through a class or, or, or sit down and, and talk with a kid because he couldn't get to a counselor. When they go to college, it's a whole different ballgame. And I know that I had a student that went to university, I mean, went to Florida State, and he came home and he said, if I didn't go to, to tutoring 
they took five dollars out of my account and I said what do you mean well apparently their food card yeah. or whatever their right. spending money card if you didn't show up for tutoring or you didn't show up for class they started taking money from you so I think the colleges have a way of monitoring and watching their kids but I'm sure by the end of their career toward the end of their career well, the career is getting shorter and shorter. Yeah. The reason I brought this up, they had a special a few weeks ago on Showtime about Ben Simmons, who's the all-pro player for the Philadelphia 76ers. Ben, ben was brought up in Australia, came to America, went to Mount Verde, which is a super powerhouse basketball. Then he went to LSU. One year. One year. They talked about, did you go to class second semester? I mean, he's a very nice young man, very well spoken. I didn't have to. Okay, that's the way it, it's geared. Now, let me ask you another question. Put you on the spot here. Okay. Okay. You sure you're it? Yep. Should college athletes be paid? You know, I'm really betwixt and between because here, yeah. my feelings about this. Yeah. I went to college on student loans. Right. So many kids are going to college on student loans. Right. When these athletes, and I understand that their scholarships are year to year, but when these athletes go to college on scholarships, they're getting their tuition. Right. That should come out of somebody's pocket. And I, I think sometimes we tend to forget that with, with all the, the rigmarole right. of all the money that's going out there. But give me a free college education. Now, at the same time, those people are owned by the school. I mean... They're working out at 5.30 in the morning. They're meeting for meeting uh, breakfasts. They get some jobs. I mean, I had a student that we sent to a school in Minnesota, and unbeknownst to me, after Thanksgiving, he was out of money because he didn't know he right. only had so much money. So I think that they need to make sure that these kids are adequately... Compensated. Compensated. Right. And there's a big bill going through this. California passed it that the athletes will be compensated in, I think, 2023. But how? They haven't worked that out yet. See, I've heard and I've yeah, read where, yeah. you know, kids can sell their, they can sell right. jerseys with their names. But right. suppose you're not one of the best. Well, Suppose you're not Joe Burrow. Suppose I'm, I'm, I'm a great um, booster for this school. I'm recruiting you. You come to my school, I'll guarantee you I'll sell 10,000 shirts. So I don't know how they're going to monitor this. It, it, it's something I know you and I talked about our, our, our kids, how much we invested in, in their student loans and everything on that. But you know what? We're just about done, time-wise. See Probably. how quick it goes? Yes, it does. Well, listen, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for inviting you me. the fun. words of wisdom. And I uh, want to thank everybody. I know this is our Christmas show, so I wish everybody a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holiday Season. We'll see you next month on... Hey, coach.